Ireland's emissions have always tracked economic growth. In the last decade, Ireland's economy has gone up and down and up again, and our emissions have done the same. This is because of the strong link between economic growth and the burning of fossil fuels. Typically, most wealthy countries create vast greenhouse gas emissions, while poor countries very little. But today, the accumulation of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere is now causing irreversible consequences for the world's climate system. With scientists warning that we are fast approaching dangerous climate change. At the UN summit in Paris, all nations made huge commitments to address climate change. But on a practical sense, what does this mean for all of us here in Ireland? Two thousand and fifteen was a monumental year for the world's climate in two ways. It smashed all records for increased global mean surface temperature, which amplified storms, flooding, and droughts all over the world. Ice caps showed more signs of collapse, while the rate of sea level rise continues to accelerate. All this represents a worrying trend for Ireland, where climate change is clearly starting to hit home. 2015 was also the year that world nations set aside their differences over one issue and decided that the worst effects of climate change must be avoided. This global agreement effectively means that all countries, including Ireland, must end the use of fossil fuels in the coming decades. But energy fuels the economy, and most of this comes from the burning of fossil fuels. So is it really feasible to have continued economic prosperity while meeting our commitments on climate change? I'm meeting Laura Burke of the EPA to find out how Ireland can live up to its global pledge. Laura, why was the COP21, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, necessary? Well, I suppose the key thing to, to know is that, and to remember, is that we have a common atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere doesn't know country boundaries, so whatever we do in one country has impacts on others. And as a developed country, we have a responsibility to reduce our emissions. There are lots of other countries in the world, least developed, that they want to aspire to the types of lifestyles that we have. Um, so. I think there's a moral responsibility on us, of course there is, that we take action and we show leadership in reducing our emissions. So Laura, what are the implications now for Ireland in complying with what's going on with the Paris Agreement? I think it's really important that we look to say, well, what kind of society do we want to be? Do we want to be a low carbon, environmentally sustainable and resilient society? So in order to be that type of society, there's lots of things we need to do. We do need to reduce our emissions across for example, our energy sector, our building sector, transport sector, and there's lots of opportunities within that. You know, our economy and even our own lifestyles are so dependent on fossil fuels. How are we going to cope with that massive transition? Well, Duncan, as the saying goes, uh, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, and so too the fossil age has to end before we run out of fossil fuels. This is probably the largest challenge that we face and we need to address it between now and 2050, but the sooner we act, the better. Because what it means is that, that the cost of inaction is much higher. The longer we leave it off and hoping that something will happen into the future, the higher the cost is going to be for Ireland as a society. The challenge of decoupling the use of fossil fuels from economic growth and prosperity is hard to picture. But there are thriving communities, cities and nations around the world that are already on this path. A few kilometres from the German border in Denmark, Sonnerberg is a typical Danish coastal community of 75,000 inhabitants. They have a saying here that you don't have to be part of a big city to be part of the big picture. Peter Ratje runs Project Zero 
a community and municipality partnership to reduce the carbon emissions from their power, heat and transport down to zero by 2029. That's just 15 years. For this initiative to be successful, it would require buy-in from all residents, businesses, local government, schools, colleges and hospitals, who would all need to be on board to achieve the zero fossil fuel transition. To get people involved in this, you know, all engaged to, to kind of go green. Yeah. I mean, are they all hippies here or what? No, not at all. This is actually an, an, a, a business community here. We have very big companies here. We have small companies. We have a lot of companies. So the thinking in this area is, is business. So the, the, the challenge here is actually to turn the thinking green. So what's motivating people? Some people are motivated by money. So by turning this green, they save money. So far, we have created 700 jobs, direct jobs, and it will continue here. We, our expectation is that we can continue growing that figure here, which is very important for the local e economy. In Ireland, we think that you can't get these sort of jobs. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, renewable energy is for the birds, really. Yeah. What would you say about that? No, that's bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it's bullshit, yeah. Because here, here we document and, and, and people love to contribute to these green sources and they save a lot of money here and it creates jobs for the industry. Hearing this from Peter seemed a little too good to be true. Could the world's biggest challenge be that easy to resolve? I had to see for myself how they're making this possible. Peter's first task was to win the hearts and minds of the community. He did this by leveraging investment into the community sports centre. They spent a lot of money upgrading this in energy efficiency and renewable sources. Jörn, a building like this in Ireland would probably cost about 50,000 euros a year to heat, and that would be all fossil fuel. 98% would be fossil fuel in Ireland, that's yes. typically. Yes. What's it like here? So when we started, this was uh, the case here. The energy now is uh, close to zero. Actually, in the summertime, we have more energy than we can use. We are talking about how to sell it, maybe in the summertime. And in terms yes. of carbon emissions, how, how good is it? It's also zero. Zero yes. carbon also? Yes, because electricity we use for the pumps, uh, we are making them ourselves with the solar energy. The importance of having not using any money for energy is that then we can use the money for making these facilities better. That is our plan. While all new buildings are now following this standard, not all existing buildings can be improved to this level. Sonnerberg's historic centre has a fine architectural heritage, but this also makes the buildings very difficult to upgrade without compromising their intrinsic value. So I wondered how they can keep these buildings warm through their cold winters. What are you going to do with these buildings? How are you going to manage that? Because you don't want to destroy we, the we, architecture. We, we of these probably buildings. have to accept that they are less energy efficient than most of the other buildings we have seen during the day here. And, make and sure the, but green district heating will fix the carbon problem. Okay, so yeah. we could do the same with our historic towns yeah, and can, cities. Yeah, yeah. Like our George and Dublin could yeah, all yeah. be district heating. Yeah. And it could be zero carbon that way. Yeah. But Sunnerberg isn't just a tourist heritage town. It's a thriving rural community, with business and industry driving a big demand for energy. Decoupling from traditional fossil fuel power stations means large wind turbines are an obvious part of the solution. But I wanted to find out what impact wind farms are having on local people. Peter took me to meet two local farmers, Fleming and Hans Jorn, who recently had two huge turbines built very close to their homes. I asked them how they feel about being part of this. How close are you? Uh, about 500 metres. 500 metres? 550 metres. Where's your house? Mm, this door. Over here, this yes. house here? Yes. So that's 500 metres away, is it? Yes. Sometimes we can hear it, but it doesn't matter. Really. And you, you're me, uh, one and a half kilometre away, yes. Fleming. And I, what, I, what I do don't you hear? hear them at all. You don't hear them at all? No. The reason for the success of wind farms in Denmark is because locals are offered shares and can profit from turbines built close to their homes. This seems like an obvious solution. And do you get much of an income from it? Is it worthwhile? I get an interest of uh, about 12%, uh, 10-12%. Okay, that's, 
Very good. That's very good. Do you think this is the right model now for all wind farms to be owned by the people locally? Yes. That they yes. all share that, it? That will be a good thing for, for the community. Co community. We need to have the, the neighbours on board here. Else it's not living up, if not, it's not living up to, to this community sinking. Wind power is an important part of Denmark's national strategy to go 100% renewable energy. But wind only blows some of the time. To help meet continuous power demands, renewables have to come from a mix of sources. Peter took me to the town's community energy centre. Now you're north of Ireland, so your solar must be less than us, you know, in the overall year. You know, how can you justify solar collectors here? Yeah, but we can still use it from March un until end of November. But behind here, you also see the, the, the biomass plant, which will support this during the winter, until we find solutions how to, to extend the take uses of the, the solar during the winter. Before we started, uh, people, local people were using natural gas, but, but they now can have their heat at half the price. Of course, there is some initial investment to, to be to be, be addressed, and, uh, but like we saw with the turbines here, this is also local people. It's a local community here who, is, who owns this on a non-profit basis. This must cost a lot of money to install. Who's paying for it? There's of course a, a, a business uh, case behind this, but this is a very strong business case. And once it's strong, the, the municipality will provide the loans, and therefore the people just have to subscri subscribe to it and, and take uh, advantage of this half price energy. So with all of this transition now into renewable energy and having this tremendous, you know, resource here, is this attracting in industry into it's, the area? It's very attracting. And, and there's a lot of attention given also at local level and at state level because this is a big, big business opportunity. If you accumulate this and do it in not only in Ireland and, and, and Denmark, but all over the world, this is probably the biggest business opportunity ever. While towns like Sonnerberg are writing the roadmap for what's possible in a community, it's the big cities of the world that are going to be the hardest to change. I decided to head for the city of Copenhagen, who've set themselves a challenge that even I find hard to believe. They plan to take fossil fuels completely out of the system in only 10 years. And they want to do all this while increasing economic growth and the health and enjoyment of the city. Already, the people of Copenhagen emit 30% less CO2 than they did a decade ago. While the population is up 10% and the economy has grown by 60% in that time. They've made Copenhagen the most cycle-friendly city in the world, where now 60% of journeys are by bicycle. Public transport is easy, cheap and fast. They've also started the transition to electric and biogas cars and public vehicles. Because of cheap district heating, nobody burns fuel at home. The prioritization of public green space and clean air means Copenhagen is one of the cleanest and healthiest cities in the world to live in. But their ambitious goals of going carbon neutral in just 10 years sounds like an impossible challenge for such a big city. So I decided to go straight to the top and meet the mayor of Copenhagen to find out how they plan to achieve this goal. Copenhageners are fully buying in on this and they are demanding that we are moving forward faster and faster. Citizens and householders, are they saying it's going to cost them more by doing this, what you're doing? Well, some of it will be more expensive for, for households. There's no doubt about that. And we are honest to our co to fellow Copenhageners about it. But actually, when you look upon it, it will be cheaper to do all the investments now than to just keep on spending a lot of energy and then find out Darn, now we have no more oil. What are we going to do? Is it benefiting the citizens now in, this, in the city? We are seeing the companies are moving to Denmark in order to be part of the good story. And actually because they also notice that the technologies that are being developed to, pick, to make Copenhagen carbon neutral, they can be exported. 
We are buying into wind turbine parks out in the uh, strait between Sweden and Denmark. We are building solar energy panels on rooftops. And is it more expensive to produce this sort of electricity? In, in the short run, yes, it's a little more expensive. But in the long run, you're going to get the money back. Uh, we're still far from being carbon neutral. Far right. from it. So but in 10 years' time, if you and I meet again, it'll be fuzzy free. You have to, as a politician, to look forward, to be uh, really out there and see what will be the major trends in 10, 20, 50 years' time. And I know that a lot of the decisions I'm part of making here, well, I'll see the benefits of them as a Copenhagener, but not as a politician. That's good for me. I don't, I don't worry about that because I know they're going to be good for the city in 10, 20, 30 years' time. I may not see all the results, but I know that Copenhagen will. It was inspiring to meet a political leader who has a real sense of civic duty and a longer-term vision for the common good. Politicians, scientists, engineers, businesses, community groups and citizens all have a shared responsibility and role to play in making this transition possible. It was encouraging to find out that one of the leading engineers playing a big part in this transition is an Irishman, Professor David Connolly. Hi, David. Thanks for coming I caught up today. with David in Ireland when he was home for a weekend trip. David, we have a huge challenge now to transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. So how can a country like Ireland afford this? Well, we can't afford not to do it because when we, uh, right now, when we look at the way we spend our money on energy, we're importing almost all of the resources that we use. About 90% of the energy we use in Ireland is imported. So that's a huge amount of money leaving the country, going to other countries like Russia and the Middle East. And if we transition towards renewable energy, instead of importing those resources, we can start spending it on local infrastructure. So that's a huge opportunity, not only to save money, but also to create an enormous amount of jobs. And we've done a study that has indicated that if we supply almost all of our energy needs with renewable energy, we can create in the region of an additional 100,000 jobs here in Ireland just in the energy sector. 100,000 jobs? 100,000 jobs due to the amount of money that will no longer be leaving Ireland on imported fuels and instead be spent on local infrastructure. David explained that when a conventional power station generates electricity, it also creates a lot of waste heat. Water is used to cool the plant, and this enormous amount of heat gets dumped. One of the obvious things to do is follow Copenhagen's model of harnessing this waste heat for district heating. So all that heat is just escaping out into the ocean. Exactly, here. yeah. So it either goes up the chimneys that we see here behind us, or else it goes into the water, because these power plants have to cool themselves. We're actually wasting heat right now from these power plants that could be supplying heat to our homes, and instead we're spending money importing fuels on faraway lands, places like Russia, the Middle East, and why would we need to transfer it all the way around the world to bring it here to Dublin, when at the same time we're taking heat out of the power plants located right here in the Dublin Bay and putting it into the, the, the river here beside us. But we, if we wanted, we could just take technology that has existed for decades and simply build pipes that transfer that heat. So how much money is being wasted here in the Bay? If you take all of the city and you take the, the maximum potential that's available in each of these power plants, we would estimate that somewhere in the region of 150 million euro a year could be actually saved in natural gas imports and instead paid to these power plants to supply the heat locally. Right, so that's 150 million a year. Over the next 10 years, that's 1.5 billion. That's a that lot of money, That is just being wasted. Yeah, just being wasted. Because we, we haven't developed the infrastructure we needed to connect these power plants to the, to the households. So for us to make that transition, how long would it take us to do this? How quickly could we do what you're saying? Well, I suppose like any piece of large infrastructure, this requires a long-term plan. This is not something that will be implemented in a few years. It takes a long-term vision and a long-term commitment for something like this to be implemented. And I suppose it's, a, it's very important for anybody that's going to invest in a piece of infrastructure like this. They need commitment from the top down that this will be something that we'll stick with for decades, not just for years. It's interesting to consider that utilizing the waste heat produced at these power stations could dramatically displace the use of heating fuels elsewhere. This is an effective way to reduce the overall demand for fossil fuel until alternative renewable energy sources come online. 
this is all electric, is it a plug-in? It is indeed, it's 100% electric. Great, and it's so silent, wow. Well, there's no engine or gearbox in it. Driving around in this now, how do you find it now compared to, say, a diesel taxi? Oh, it's a beautiful car to drive. It's much simpler than a petrol or diesel car. If you take now fuel consumption now compared to, say, a diesel, what, how, how does it compare? Well, I reckon I run roughly on 15% of the price of diesel. 15%? Yes. Really? What sort of savings would that make in a year? Well, I'd say I would save about three and a half to 4,000 euros. In a year? Yes. Right. That's a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. The technologies available that could help us reduce our emissions and save us a lot of money always amazes me. But how do we mainstream these? I asked political and economic scientist, Professor John Barry, what Ireland could do to decouple our dependence on fossil fuel. John, in countries like Sweden and Denmark and across Europe, Germany, Austria, all of these countries are now moving rapidly towards zero carbon. But we're very, very slow in Ireland to actually make this transition to a zero carbon economy. What mechanism needs to drive that change? Well, we need, first of all, political leadership to really indicate that we are going to retire and move away from a fossil fuel based economy. We also need to use fiscal you know, um, drivers such as subsidies uh, and also taxes. Uh, because the sad reality is that despite the current drop in oil prices, for example, oil from an ecological and full cost economic viewpoint is too cheap. It does not include the climate change effects of oil, never mind the impact on local environments and whether it's Nigeria or elsewhere where oil is extracted or refined, or indeed the public health costs of our addiction to fossil fuels. So we also need to use subsidies in terms of subsidising, you know, the transition to low carbon energy and above all, this transition from a fossil fuel based economy to a low carbon one has to be a just transition so that the poor most vulnerable in society are not the ones most badly affected. So to do that, what mechanism do we need to make that change? Well, I think the first thing is to is raise awareness. I mean, most people do not realise, and I'm quoting now from the International Monetary Fund, you know, hardly a bastion of radical thinking. They did a report last year and they showed that the global economy is subsidizing fossil fuels to the tune of 5.4 trillion US dollars. And that works out at $10 million a minute to subsidize fossil fuels. We have to realize that we are massively subsidizing fossil fuels. And what that's doing then is locking us into a carbon-based system. So whenever you hear in the media and in politics about the subsidies to renewable energy, they are vastly, vastly outdwarfed by the fact that we are locking ourselves into a carbon-based system. This should not be driven by a sense of fear and dread and some sort of environmentalist, you know, doom saying. This is a positive for Ireland in terms of we have the abundant energy resources, renewable energy resources, to be a world leader in leading the way in terms of this low carbon energy transition. It's clear from John that the biggest challenge to all of this is much more economic and political than it is technical. Joseph Curtin is a policy and economic analyst who's been working in this area for more than 10 years. So to drive this massive change, what do we need? Well, I suppose at its very core, we need people to care. We need people to think that this is important. And when people think this is important, then our governments and our public representatives will think it's important and it will go to the top of the agenda. So I think that's the first thing we need. The second thing we need then is to help the market to direct the market in a way that's going to respond to this challenge. And the way to do that is by sending signals through things like carbon taxes, but also for providing incentives um, to people so people can become part of this, so they don't feel like it's something that's happening to them, they feel that it's something they're participating in. Can we as a society flourish, and can our young generation flourish in that new world? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that what we first of all need to understand about the transition from fossil fuels is it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, because fossil fuels are a finite resource. So climate change is really just changing the timeline. At the end of this journey, we're going to have an abundant, plentiful and cheap source of energy which is going to power our economy without any of the negative side effects in terms of air pollution, sulfur dioxide, acid rain or climate change. Embracing this new future will not only give us a clean and healthy environment, but it will also bring sustainable jobs, 
energy independence and a better chance of prosperity. So what are we waiting for?